Okay. Right. 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 Um, <laughs> may take that one that it's always going to use it. Um, it's going to be your side table. Your side table, you know, for your side. vegetables I'm eating here. Recording it uh, that for uh, MI5, MI6, and MI7. Okay. Yeah. Right. Are you really sure MI5 and MI6 can actually get that? It's all the no? Uh, by the way, if anyone, actually, if anyone is from MI5, MI6 watching this, please, we, need, we could always... I don't need to know that you're actually very welcome, because you've got most of the drugs, and we need to get hold of them for our people who are very sick. Thank you. Right, moving swiftly on from that little moment of madness. Yeah, so um, well maybe we should just introduce to one another who we are and what we're doing here. And, uh, Let's hope you guys can actually hear this. Okay, okay so I'm Andrea and I'm um, a mum and I'm an activist in Occupy. And I, before I became a mother in 2007, I uh, was deeply, deeply involved and still am to some degree with drug policy reform. And particularly, I was involved with organising drug users who are or had been dependent on injection drugs, yeah? So, you know, heroin, cocaine, whatever they could get their hands on in my case. So, and I was getting quite, um, how does one put this without meaning to scare people? I was getting, um, deeply disillusioned with um, right, there are some great service providers meaning, do you want to say who you are you guys? I don't know who, sorry, what's your name? I'm not from there, my guy but I'm not from there Okay, now Okay, now, do you want Or an infiltrator, you know at least uh, Do you want us to do uh, this ourselves? Yeah, seriously, I, I meant to just say my name. So my name is Angel, I'm going to be presenting today. Yes. I'm Steve. I'm Adam. I'm also a student. <laughs> <laughs> Obi. I'm doing the live stream. Excellent. Uh, Anthony's student of life. Excellent. I'm Ryan's student. I'm Diane's student. Probably more active. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry, I forgot that. We're not from one. So basically, I was getting a bit disillusioned that although there were and are and continue to be some fantastic, can I stand up actually? Can I do something more than that? I can't help it. Some people who are clearly very committed to saving the lives of this group of people who, you know, obviously are a minority. Um, there are also a lot of people who either haven't got a clue what they're doing because they don't even know the basics, like they don't know what addiction is, and that is pretty fundamental if you're going to work with this group. 
or they are so um, dependent on their wages from this very corrupted state, it, it, it's very difficult to actually provide the services that people need. So, for example, up until fairly recently, and in fact it probably still does happen, not often, but in many American states, you would go to prison, not for long, but you could go to prison, for giving out clean needles to an injection drug users for the prevention of HIV and hepatitis and other blood borne diseases. So, of course, that is kind of crazy. And now that kind of thing is happening more in Southeast Asia and, you know, Indonesia and so on and so on. Pockets of the state, Southeast Asia. Russia is a mess. Anyway, so look, before I get into this broad, you know, around the world, many people are dying, you shouldn't be dying, which is such a huge story. You get the drift, right? That there are certain basic things that this group of people must have to stay alive. The problem has been for us, I was one of those people for a long time, the problem has been for us is that um, in terms of In terms of um Sorry. I need to see what I'm doing here. Um in terms of uh, even within, you know, drug policy reform circles which are quite liberal, I mean, you know, this is I say this a little bit, you know, what's the word when you have to throw salt over your shoulder? Take it with a pinch of salt. You know, it's not always the most perfect place for somebody, particularly if you don't want to inject drugs anymore. Not because everybody's injecting drugs in there or taking drugs, because they're not. But there's such a liberal vibe there, you know, mm -hmm. that, you know, it may not be the perfect place for you. But if you're political about drugs, which I am, and I have been for decades now, then it's a perfect place, really, because, you know, there people are really talking about, you know, why are we going to prison in the first place, right? So why are people going to prison in the first place, in actual fact? Now, Obi over there, being smart as he is and everything, reminded me of the very basic thing. And so did my friend Lucy Reed. Um, but in the end, quite a lot of what's really going on, whether it's mental health or drug dependency or whatever, what is actually going on is that people are being incarcerated en masse, uh, discriminately, you know, it's called drug use, whether it's cannabis or heroin or cocaine or whatever it is, because, you know, we can't employ them, we can't give them hospital care. Does this all make sense what I'm saying here at the moment? Does this make any sense? We can't stop them getting HIV because we refuse to do, you know, the basic stuff because we think it's morally wrong to quote unquote encourage somebody who's already addicted to injection drug use. So, you know, and some of these ideas are becoming already in parts of the world old fashioned. So that's really good, of course, right? Eh? Um, to, to, you know, there's endless numbers of countries, even at least there are what, 50 East American states, about 40 now have some kind of access to clean needles, lots of methadone around, Givitex, other substitution drugs, yeah? Now, what we needed to do, as I understand it in the drug policy reform movement, is connect that group, which is relatively small, to the rest of the drug use and community, and more importantly, of course, to the people who were, you know, bringing this out as a political issue, right? So, of course, I don't know what you guys know, but you may know more, actually, in terms of the US. They've got a lot more money to do drug policy reform. Now, I don't want to get into that one too much, because I'm not an American, and I don't know the depth of it, but I did go to a lot of their conferences, and to cut a long story short, they got, you know, uh, rich, what they call it, philanthropists, like George Soros, okay, okay, don't all throw something at me, <laughs> and others, to fund the exchange in Eastern Europe, particularly Russia, and so on and so on. But 
so many minutes. And then the connecting bit, which is what I was trying to say, was basically medical cannabis, right? Because med medical cannabis, of course, forget the recreational bit for a moment, medical cannabis actually is one way that you might actually speak of the endless numbers of ex heroin users. I mean, a lot of us have got put down the heroin, but we didn't want to or couldn't, couldn't stay off drugs completely. But we did find that if we smoke marijuana twice a week, it, you know, changed our lives for the better, yeah? I'm not advocating any of this, by the way. All I'm doing is telling you what happens, yeah? I'll tell you if you like what I advocate later, but not yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, so that's one connection. And anyway, generally speaking, generally speaking, much more importantly, there are now in the world many, many thousands of people who have been or are injecting drugs who are infected with hepatitis C, hepatitis B, HIV, and so on and so on. So again, medical marijuana has been shown to alleviate, ameliorate some of the symptoms of HIV, as in, you know, getting people to eat when they're really underweight, and alleviating pain, and so on and so on. And so we jumped on that. Uh, that is, the leaders of the drug policy removed reform movement jumped on this issue to join the dots. And I certainly jumped on it when I was, I used to ed edit a magazine called The Easy Boy. Because I was always, always, always trying to find a way to get our very alienated, isolated community in with the rest of those concerned about drug policy in the world, and particularly of course drug law, because it's the drug law that um, will get you incarcerated. Now, how many of you know about Colorado and all that at the moment? Colorado, mm -hmm. Washington, most of you. Do you know about all that? Yeah, right. So, Colorado and Washington have pretty miraculously, but maybe not, uh, most legalized for the time being. Uh, cannabis, but before we get all too excited, before I get too excited anyway, um, the Fed still has the right to take that backwards. But Holder, who's some, I think it was the Attorney General, did the Attorney General? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's, he's basically said that they're going to let them carry on with that. So that's those two states in America. And many of us have felt for a very long time in the reform movement that, you know, obviously it's with cannabis we have to start this thing because it is seen to be the least dangerous. I'm not commenting on that. Personally, it isn't for me, but it is for a lot of people. Um, and also we've got Uruguay. We've got that amazing president down there who behaves like, you know, Mr. Joe Smith, you know, I don't take a huge wage just because I'm the president of this country, but I am sure that probably legalizing marijuana is the way forward. It's like, my God. So from, from my point of view, let me just say, wow. <laughs> I mean, it's so great for us. We've been working on this stuff for like, in my case, 25 years. Other people maybe longer. Some people paid. A lot of us not paid. And suddenly these things, you know, this prohibition, this punishing, forget the word prohibition for a moment, from my point of view, the issue is it's so punishing for us, you know, I don't really want to say this on sound losers, but leave it there, leave it there. From my point of view, you know, when I was, you know, very caught up with this myself, I was not bloody well. There were things I did when I was injecting drugs, <laughs> you know, that I have never done since. I never did before injecting drugs and I never did after. So that tells me something, doesn't it? I think it tells most of us that just being dependent on the injection of heroin, in my case, and actually quite a few of us, let's be honest, changes us because of the chemical sense, right? The chemical sense. So, 
So it was with some huge joy that I started to read about this stuff in the last few years. And I think, in fact, I thought to myself, I, I won't worry about going back to a party reform now. All the things we've been fighting for are starting to happen. And, and then I thought, well, that's not quite right, because of course we've got so far, you know, we've got so much to do yet. We've got so much to do yet. Um, you know, when I consider that, you know, we have <coughs> still, to this day, such punishing regimes in, in Russia, Southeast Asia. Now, can I just mention Russia, from my point of view again, uh, where injectors and opiophiles, as we call them, are concerned. Russia still has law which says that methadone, opiate substitute, is illegal. So most of their opiophiles are trying to, you know, get their drugs on the street, and most of that is God knows what mix of it, and all the usual stuff that we know about the punitive prohibitive system. Consequently, and this is where you know, that the anger comes from, from, from me, is that we have, you know, it's more than half a million people now living with HIV in Russia alone. Something like a million point something in China, Iran is the same, all of which could have been avoided. You know, and it, it's really hard, you know, to sort of think of that, you know, but, and here's the good news, this is what I wrote down in my little book, the new road. <laughs> yeah. Since 1976 at least, I mean probably there's a lot of history I don't know about. Uh, so I used like myself, who, you know, were very committed at one time to injection drug users, have been just literally getting up that, filling them up with needles and putting them on the back, off on bicycles, and just going to their own communities. And doing this, you know, over and over, making sure that each of their friends and their, you know, anybody they know is injected has got a clean needle, so that at least they don't get one of these viruses, right, which could kill them. Now, the way it's developed over the years is that it was always something like that. One brave man or one brave woman, or both, or whatever it was, did that, and then the local government would hear about it. And then the local government would say, well, that's obviously the right way to go, isn't it? Because, you know, stopping so and so getting HIV and hepatitis and it's going to cost us so much to treat HIV and hepatitis so why don't we prevent this? So slowly but surely, so you know there was little Ronald on a bicycle in 1976, you know there's various people in this country, it was different in as much we, it's never been illegal in the UK, in the UK, yeah? It was morally seen to be off the wall, so until HIV there was no access to clean needles. And I know for myself, I used to break into the back. Listen, if you get bored or anything, or you've got a question, please ask me. You know what I mean? Great. Sounds great. Right. Um, yeah, so, you know, we used to, we used to just go to casualty, you know, the emergency room, and we pretend that we were there for whatever reason. And the real reason that we were there was to, you know, to pocket a few clean needles, yeah? because it might be the only way that we could get at them. So, you know, things have changed because of a few, as I see it anyway, uh, a few brave people with different parts. And they weren't all drug users. So let's be clear about that. I need to be clear about that. You know, some of them were just, you know, enlightened drug workers, researchers, nurses. In fact, Nicola Woodward, you know, perfect example. Local nurse. Spot people like me, you know, Robin Lee, Pharmacies, you know, pharmacies, the needles from the casualty. Goes off to Jerry Stinson, professor of whatever he does, policy and all that, whatever, <laughs> drug stuff. And says, look, Jerry, we need to do a research paper, we need to prove that needle exchange is going to prevent this virus from spreading. Off they go, boom. Then we have a working party on HIV. Peter Tatchell supports us. And, you know, by 1986 in this country, we had the rudiments of needle exchange, right? So, you know, over the years it's developed. And we have this Virginia Berridge, who's an academic around the corner at LFA. She's always said that, you know, we have these 10 year cycles of, oh, we're going to be more punished. Oh, no, we're not going to be so punished. And, oh, we're going to change it. You know, and that's what happens. And at the moment, 
we're going through a bit more of a punishment cycle, although it's not quite that simple. Because with Cameron, does anybody else know in this room that Cameron's got a very close associate who's one of my tribes, as it were? Yes. Okay. So, right. So he, he has a he has a family member that um, that um, I don't know if she's still using today, but she she was, and he, you know, he's written about it in the press that he's associated with various people in 12-step recovery. That means, you know, like Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, you know? Um, and, he's, you know, he said quite openly that he himself has taken, you know, drugs recreationally in his youth and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, what he's doing is very much pr promoting, along with all the localism stuff, by the way, so that's a serious problem for us, and I'll explain that in a moment. What he's been promoting is the whole recovery agenda. So the only way to be, if you're an opiophile, is to be drug free. Yeah? Now, of course, that is a bloody serious problem. Because, like, if you're not able or willing or whatever it is, and it's always a mixture of both, let me tell you, what's the point of, you know, you know, I've tried so many times to get off drugs and failed so many times. And that is the trajectory of most of us, right? That is not the trajectory of just Andrew and her mate John. He's dead, actually. But anyway, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's the trajectory of most of us. And I think that it's not a bad thing to promote recovery. Right? Of course it's not a bad thing to promote recovery. I think it's a great thing, but it's not a good thing if then your expectation is that everybody follow that road. And if they don't, they're not going to be looked after. And that's our big concern today as we stand in 2014. And in fact, we've got the next National User Conference in a week in uh, Birmingham. So I feel, speaking as a person living in London, that there is a lot of work to do in this area because, you know, if we see that the, um, the results of this so-called war on drugs, I mean, this war on drugs, by the way, has never been a war on drugs at all. You know, I don't see opium poppies and cannabis leaves jumping up and going, oh, I don't want your war. You know, it's people who say it, right? It doesn't work like that. So, it's always those who cannot afford treatment or some kind of uh, care to deal with their addiction or just, you know, like the vast majority of people who, who take illegal drugs recreationally, who obviously, in my opinion, should not be punished. Um, you know, all of that group of people need, as far as I'm concerned, greater... Um, Opportunity is probably the best word to organise, you know, because, well, I don't know, geez, I get so fed up with people, I mean, maybe I'm just intolerant, but we've had some problems in the cannabis movement of this country lately, which looks to me like two male egos. We've had, you know, the death of a leading light among in the uh, addictive community, yeah. And by the way, there's some people who don't like that addiction. Paragon, so let me be a bit careful about that. <laughs> um, um, so that this guy, Alan Joyce, God rest his soul and everything, he died last summer. So since then, the National Users Network really hasn't been in operation. But there have been local, as I say, local groups organising. And, you know, they're very much this kind of, you know, clean and green idea which is fine for them, you know, if that's what you can do. But the truth is, and I do want to say this, you know, for the record, even today as I stand here and I haven't injected drugs for some years, it is not easy to know that on a very bad day, which I did have, let's say, three or four years ago, when the social services of this country decided that they would scrutinise my family, right, that... You know, there's a guy just over there, probably, you know, that like stone show away that I could go over and buy heroin from, you know. And actually, that 
quite a lot of us have been coerced into abstinence and being so-called clean, when actually we didn't really want to, but we couldn't afford the lifestyle. We couldn't afford the lifestyle, and frankly, and this is just for me, you know, I, I do not speak for the millions of people in the world who infect us. I was always ambivalent, you know, because it's like people that loved me would be like, what are you doing? You know, why are you, you know? So anyway, summary. There is a growing drug policy reform movement all over the world, which is hugely exciting. There are still millions of people that are infected with HIV and other viruses that really should never have gone through that, who will die young inevitably. And there are also millions of people around the world who use drugs recreationally who should not be the target of the state and the, particularly of the legal system. So that's my message. I don't really, to be honest, I mean, there's a huge amount more I could say to you. Uh, but how I, just one more thing to finish off, it's about Occupy and me and drugs and so on. Um, when I came to Occupy, I had this dream, which went a bit like this. The trillions, probably, of narcozones in the bank are messing up, you know, the banking system. It's not just about people who launch drugs because they're criminal in other departments. There must be, God only knows, you know, because I certainly haven't got a clue, and I don't know if any of us in this room do, but we know about HSBC recently. Mm -hmm. We've got exposed, and there are other banks involved with laundering, you know, heaps and heaps of money. So I said to myself, I know, I'll go to Occupy, because they're talking about the banking scandals and how corrupted those banks are. And, and I really thought, honest to God, you know, talk, talk about Andrea being naive. I thought everybody would be like, yeah, let's do it, Andrea. Come on, let's go and show those banks how. <laughs> and I was very upset to find that, you know, there were so few cases. I was like, hmm, okay. And then I finally got the courage in December 2011 at St. To um, do this talk right today. And uh, it's not as many people in fact, it's very similar to today. And um, I noticed something that day, which is that I felt extremely scared. I suddenly thought, well, here you are, standing up in a completely public space, talking about these very wicked people. But people have been talking about these very wicked people for a long time, this is not the first time, right? But I think there is actually something, if I may say so, I may be completely deluded, and if you think I am, please let me know, straight away. I think there is something quite genuine, or authentic, or specific, or I can't find the word, unique maybe is the word, about somebody who has survived their own personal drug war, standing up and confronting that that particular part of this jigsaw puzzle. Because, you know, I have a head full of dead bodies, you know. I have a brain full of dead bodies, and I am not going to let the world forget. I'm not going to let the world forget. Because some people, all of us actually, who are still here, have inspired their own little, you know, or not so little trouble. We, we need to get out there and tell the story. Anyway, I'm going to shut up now, and I hope that you don't throw anything at me. Right? <laughs> 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 Hi guys, any questions from you? <laughs> any questions? Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, no, I just want to say a few things about the state. Yeah, okay. I think um, the, the drug policy reform movement is really exciting. And I think it's really exciting that the state has made the decisions that they made. Elsewhere in the state, the, um, the police and the justice system is so corrupted now by this um, idea of
people are just being basically dragged off, you know, and drug being implanted in people's houses or whatever. And, you know, it, it becomes such a, such a, a money maker for the police departments and for the, the local True. authorities involved. Yeah. That, that, you know, there's where you would feel difficult, you know, there's where the difficulty is, not so much in legalized, well, yeah, in legalized drugs, because simply, just because the system has become, you know, I mean, it was always, it was never, like, really clean before, but now it's so vicious and corrupt. I was just reading something on the web the other day about um, kids who were put in jail by a couple of judges mm -hmm. who were being paid off by the prison system, you know, by mm -hmm. private prisons. So, you know, I think there, in the, in the U.S., there are a lot of problems with that. I think in, the, in, in South America, it's not just Uruguay, but, you know, I think there was a mass, there was some kind of massive meeting that Obama was supposed to go to about two years ago, and Obama wanted to say one thing, and they wanted to say, fuck the drug laws, all right, all of them, <laughs> together. So, you know, I think that's, that's really a, a good thing. Um, and so also I was going to say, I think with the new exchanges, they were positive, but unfortunately they, they hit with, I mean, I remember when they were also in London, and they hit with an awful lot of residents opposition, yeah. you know, because of that, and, and we're still dealing with it, I mean, you know, there's, we're not maybe right here, but certainly two blocks away, there's a big kind of highway going from King's Cross to the club down to Foxwell, and like our state is, is on that highway, and, you know, so we have deals going on by like Friday and 6 a.m. and in the afternoon, you know, and I'm kind of caught up in a weird position because I don't want to be critical on the one hand, but on the other, it are kids yeah, trying to play out and we don't know when they're going to get hit up. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's a, it's a hard situation, you know, I don't, yeah, as I say, I, you know, I've been a drug user, not, not anything to do, not anything to do with heroin, but, you know, I don't want to be hypocritical about it, but on the other hand, you know, there's also the imperative to try to protect people. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Right. Going, you know, getting lost or other, you know, other sorts of things. So that's. Well, that's a great input. That's a great input. I mean, I just want to respond to the thing that you said about the seriousness of heroin. Mm -hmm. In and of itself, of course, heroin is is. I mean, out there, yeah. it really is dangerous. Yeah. When you go around the corner and try and yeah. get it, you don't know what the hell you're going to buy. But if yeah. you if you do, which 500 people are lucky enough. Yeah. Fortunate enough in inverted commas yeah. to get um, prescribed heroin, you're not in the same situation. But again, if you inject it, unless you know what you're doing, it's exactly. still got it. No, that's the thing is that opiates are, are proven to be one of the safest painkillers ever. All right, so it's sort of you know you're in people are in this line that in fact you know if, if you could just sort of have a regular habit that you know and you could get you know regular stuff, then it's actually not that thing. Yeah. You know, and if you weren't sort of killing yourself trying to sort of avoid the law and get the money and all that sort of thing, yeah. then yeah. it's actually, you know, amongst, you know, when you compare it to, say, pharmaceuticals, you know, there was something on the radio recently about how, you know, there's this massive upswing in the state and people dying of yeah. pharmaceutical yeah. And there's all this other kind of stuff. Like codeine. Codeine and, and, Your uh, and crystal meth and, you know, all this other stuff that people are kind of inventing for themselves and the waste is always illegal, you know. It's unnatural that you can do that. It's really, it's really a problem. And, you know, say things like, or even things like cocaine. I mean, talking about, you know, I need to know if you're a citizen and want to want to be in. Of course. And, you know, and so, you, you know, I always thought with the, with the bank thing, well, yeah, that was obviously a cocaine is, you know, and all these problems. We're all cocaine is, as far as I can see. And, mm -hmm. but, but we have this sort of thing where, you know, you've got the kind of natural drug. And then you've got these various kind of industrial re re refined, re refining, refining, yeah, refining yeah, of yeah, it. And yeah. so, you know, say something like, synthetic. you know, synthetic, yeah, 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 yeah it sort of gets more and more synthetic. Yeah. Easier to transport, which yeah. is one reason why that happens. But, yeah. um, but it, also, it also concentrates the drug quite a lot. So, you know, say something like a coca leaf, if you have coca tea, yeah. it's a better buy than coffee without, yeah. without the kind of edge to it. Yeah. Um, but you can't get coca leaves. So no, not, you not. Know. Well, you can't get coca leaves if you're in the drug party of Okay. <laughs> 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 I did. Okay, you know, then you have things where people are trying to do, you know, they're trying to do things that are, you know, 
<laughs> yeah, we have a few selections. Okay. Oh, you could. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. And he kind of eventually got shut down. Yeah. 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 But, yeah. Um, you know, so you do sort of have these pockets of people just sort of rising up and trying to do something, and then, you know, getting spots. I mean, he was raided, I don't know how many times by the police. So. Well, this is, right, can I just say, like, this is why it's sort of for me that Occupy is so important, because in the end, we're really tackling inequality, or at least that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to tackle inequality and how it emerges and the roots of it and yada, yada, yada. And like for me, I, I really do believe that, you know, if we did end this so-called drug war, we would just be demolishing over, you know, it would take time, it wouldn't happen like that. But over a decade or two, we would be reducing so much of the nonsense because, you know, you couldn't just, you know, pick on people because they had to smoke a little bit of marijuana and be black and stick them behind bars anymore. You know, because they didn't have a lawyer that they could pay $100,000 to or whatever to get them off the hook. So, you know, it, it's really, to me, you know, when Obi reminds me that it's about the war on the poor, it absolutely is the war on the poor. And, you know, you've got every right to be. I've got a child, so I know a bit about this, you know. But what I try to do with that situation is just tell me really straight off. You know, she's six now, she's articulate, she understands things. You know, it's to tell her straight up. And if you ever find a needle on the street, you never touch it. You know, just tell mummy she'll come and sort it out. These sort of things, you know, and in fact, just on a, on a positive note where that's concerned, you know, one of the um, very great music groups in the world, as I see it anyway, is uh, based in Copenhagen. And one of the things they did was they got everybody, which is really Occupy style in the activism, they got everybody these like very, you know, yellow jackets, whatever, like we were on bicycles. And they all had activists on the back, spelt with a K, not C. <laughs> and they literally, en masse, every other afternoon, go down to all the frontline areas that you're just describing and pick up all the dirty work and dispose of them safely, you know. And stuff like that, we've started to do around the world. This is not unusual. Vancouver do it. Vancouver actually has, has won an award in the last few years. The so-called Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users, who was actually big up for her living stone, even though some of the users gave her a hard time. This woman, we just call her St. Anne. Personally, I think that, you know, it's all right to be patronised when you're in the gutter and you can't really, you know, bring your head up because you're so ashamed. A lot of people felt pissed off with her, but you know, she was the backbone. She was the administrative body of this organisation for a long time. And now that it's up and running, you know, other people can do that. But, you know, these people, for me, I mean, they are a bit like saints. Anyway, I've gone up on one again. Anybody else got any questions? <laughs> or comments? Okay. Angela, so um, I've heard about the Portuguese in Australia. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is that. Um, Okay, so let me go to Australia first, because I think they've been quite progressive for long years. Um, so a religious person and lots of other people, community activists, doctors, blah, blah, yada, 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 came together over, well, it must be at least 12 years ago now, actually, and they established the first safer injection room that had, you know, public media attention. And so it's just a place where if you were you know, dependent on injection drugs, you could go in there and there was always, you know, there are always people around who you can talk to about your situation. But the most important thing, of course, is that you're not on the street in an alleyway shooting guns, hurting yourself potentially and freaking people out who may be passing by. So a lot of the way that we argued for those places was to take the It was to take the trouble off the street. I want to find a word that is not unfriendly to my community. It's just so hard. <laughs> it's to get people off the street, you know, that aren't, you know, housed. You know, a lot of people aren't bloody throwing needles away because they're 
and she's so sure. They just, if they have them in their pocket, they can in, in this city today, people can still get arrested for crime's sake because, you know, if they find the work, the cops, and in fact, most cops, I think, you know, now, a bit savvy, they just get rid of it. But, you know, there is still the opportunity for a cop who needs some promotion or whatever to get, you know, he finds a trace of heroin or whatever in the needle, you could be punished again. So, but anyway, yeah, so that's Australia, and they've spread a bit all over the world, actually. So there's various, Germany is very good, Switzerland now have got um, not only the safe injection rooms, but they've got various uh, prescribed heroin programs that are quite well known about. And for me, what is quite interesting about the Switzerland situation is that there was a referendum, of course. The people were allowed to vote. Would they support this? And over 63% voted for, because they could see, it isn't exactly rocket science, that people didn't break into their houses because they were antisocial, but they broke into their houses because <coughs> they needed money to go. So, um, and then also about Switzerland, um, they they have to pay a little bit. And that, I think, is quite important from my point of view, if I may say. You know, it may not be that important to everybody sitting here, but I think it, it says, you know, and, and also that if you can't afford to pay, there is, you know, like a sliding scale. So it's not, you know, that if you can't pay, you won't be prescribed. Portugal has an interesting situation. Basically, if you are caught using any illegal drug, you will go to a so-called, um, what are they, um, it's like an administrative body of people, some of whom are medical and some of whom are in between medical and legal, if you like. I can't really think of, you know. And basically, you will have a conversation and the vast majority will be, you know, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, goodbye. They might be fine. But those who are thought to be or are dependent, chemically dependent, get the opportunity of basically, you know, seeking out treatment as opposed to. Now, treatment doesn't mean in that in, in that instance necessarily they have to get off drugs, but it might well mean that they go and get prescription that means that they don't have to buy illegal drugs and so on and so on. So, in, in as much as What's good about that, clearly, is that people have stopped being punished. Any more questions or comments? Sorry, I've got one. Um, I was watching the news um, and maybe a couple of months ago, and they, they had a, well, it was filmed the day, but didn't really tend to that, between Matthew, okay. Pe between Matthew Perry, the African friend, okay. and Peter Hitchin. Oh, yeah. Um, and there was this idea of drug costs, and uh, former um, users, um, Kind of administering justice um, in these special courts where they where they dress more informally and it's less um, oh it's less austere, you know, like less um, you know less court in this way. Yeah. I wondered what you thought about that. And yeah. Also, also, yeah. Well, to be honest, I wasn't aware that that last bit you said. I know about drug courts, but I didn't know about that former users and. Right. Well, in it really depends culturally and politically on where you are in the world. Like in America, that is forward. Over here, I think most user activists and people who work in the harm reduction movement wouldn't really... You know, it's very devious, actually, if you think about it. It could be helpful. You know, I don't want to say point blank it's not helpful. It could be helpful. But it's kind of tinkering with a very deeply off the wall system already, do you know what I mean? You know, better that there's a, you know, let's use a... But you see what I'm saying, it, it's not exactly... I mean, I, I don't know what other people here think, maybe if I can open this up for discussion. We've got Russell Brown now out there. Uh, and my... Uh, you know, he's saying what he's saying about the legislation and the way it needs to change and the reason that, you know, Seymour Hoffman died recently. Do you all know about Seymour Hoffman? Right, actor Howard Seymour Hoffman, very well known, tons of American films and others, died recently and was of an overdose of heroin and was found with a 
huge amount of, you know, bags of heroin in his home. And, you know, I was discussing this with a fellow ex-user the other day, and everything that has come out of this is that he clearly, you know, busted up with his wife, no access to his children, and he just lost his will to live, and the poor man died. And Russell Brand apparently went on the TV, I didn't see it, but, and said that the reason that Howard died was because he um, was a victim of the punitive prohibitive system. Well, yes, and really no. Because in his case, you know, he didn't have a problem with buying drugs. He had as much money as anybody needed. <laughs> and yes, he had to hide, and so in that sense, he was a victim of the prohibitive system. But mostly, he was a victim of some very, very painful emotions. But seemed to, I don't know, like, I think I need to be careful with this one, because, you know, I don't know the man. I never knew him, and I don't know, you know, the details of his situation. But I think it's naive of Russell Brand to say that, because I think it's not quite as simple as that. You know, yes, he was a victim of prohibition, and actually it's always a bit more than that. Had I died when I was using, I was very open. I used to walk down the street with, ba in fact, the user community, I was... People would just not walk down the street with me, because, you know, I'm a very open person. I mean, obviously, that like, being in this room right now, talking about this stuff, I'm very interested in the way I am, right? And I... Yeah, I was also unmanageable because I was an hand addict. So I used to walk down the street with bandages falling off me that I'd wrapped up my bleeding hands and abscesses. And literally, the other addicts, I mean, this wasn't always like that. The, the other drug users would just walk on the other side of the road because I was too hot. I would retract the heat, you know, the flu. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, and actually, to be honest, even then, we're talking about 82 when that sort of stuff was going on. Um, the police weren't really interested. You know, what, the only way that they were interested in me was who did I buy off. So they might follow me around for a few hours or a few of my, you know, people to find out who were the middle level dealers in the neighbourhood. But they weren't really, um, you know. So, so I don't know how we're going to bring this system down. I mean, I, I think that, I don't know, you know, again, please tell me if you think I'm totally naive, but I really do think that we're seeing the beginning of the end of this now. You know, I really do. Because I think that, you know, once we, I've, I've been saying for years, please, we must get the religious leaders involved in this, you know. The problem with that might be that the Vatican Bank has some interesting dollars in it. You know, it is very kind of difficult when you've got a, you know, there must be laundered narco dollars in every huge bank that you can think of. So it does get very complicated. But, but if you say that in principle, the punishing system, which is what we managed to do, by the way, in 2008, NGOs from all over the world gathered at the United Nations in Vienna, and we were forced to do the Occupy the Daily thing. We, we weren't allowed to, like, if we disagreed about anything, we were all sent out of the UN nuclear, you know, the building, not the building, the room, where the major discussions were going on. We had to go off and have a consensus, you know, reach a consensus in another room. Yeah, it's very interesting. This was only five years ago. And uh, we basically agreed that the response to all drug use, illegal drug use, must be where necessary treatment and when it's not necessary, uh, a less punitive approach. So, you know, there is reason to be cheerful, but there's also, as you pointed out, you know, it's embedded itself, the entire system of, you know, the skin system transition has embedded itself in so many different structures, it does seem impossible. You know, at, at times you think there's no way we can change this, but I, I don't believe that because, I mean, you know, there were many, 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 many days 
where thousands of people like me said there's no way that I can stop taking heroin. And I know we're all individuals and that's a different story. But, you know, we have occupied. We didn't think we were going to have occupied two and a half years ago. We've changed the lexicon of this country around the drug, uh, around the, you know, the money thing, you know. So you always have to, don't you, like, be hopeful. And, um, and I feel that the more that the victims of the so-called drug war grow up and, you know, become more mature as activists, I feel that the sky's the limit as to what we can achieve. Because I think, you know, they can do it without us, but what movement has ever achieved victory without, you know, I mean, people start the anti apartheid movement or the gay liberation movement or any movement, you can't really do it without those who have been oppressed by it. Um, so, anyway, what else? I don't know, I, I guess like, well, yeah, that's probably isn't really going to be Just because, um, well, I mentioned, well, oh, probably, no. I was, yeah, but a couple of, um, years ago, I spent quite some time in Bolivia. Ah, where, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yeah, Cole Colleen, who was a coca farmer, um, in his, like, before his kind of mm -hmm. and that coca, yeah, basically, the, the coca leaf is massively important culturally. And it's really a million miles away from cocaine because yeah, it's used for tea, it's used for just like chewing, it has the altitude, it has minor so it's it, it, yeah, it's also used in kind of they are really trying to develop like um, kind of a lot of industry in like using cocaine in like cosmetics and just like, you know, kind of health products. Mm. It is really it has a lot of uses mm. and then it's yeah, it's culturally hugely important, yet obviously the US is, is massively advocating tracking down the entire culture in between the whole country. I know that Bolivia like, is not the only place, although it's just putting some other coca. So, yeah, for me, kind of always seems very much like a excuse in the form of nomination. And obviously, if you say countries like Colombia or Mexico, it looks like it is. Okay, like, it's, it's not this kind of interest mm -hmm. on those countries. And then obviously the whole, um, yeah, like you said, the whole importance of um, drug money for the banking system is something really quite big as well. So it is, yeah, it's, it's just, I don't know, for me it's inside, it's just a really big part. Yeah, like you and hedge your body if you want as well, like the yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah.
that might be something we could consider getting some of our roots into. Um, I'm just slightly, what is the time? 18.23. we got seven minutes. Is there an interest, do you think, in our extra circles for some, you know, just some kind of drug policy working group, if anyone don't? I mean, has anybody got the time more to the point? That's the big question, isn't it? Mm. I'm not looking at you this morning. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. You are so cool. <laughs> I, I, I'm just going to say, you're an amazing public speaker. It's, it's, uh, yeah, I've just learned so much about addiction. Um, I, I guess I have a couple of things to say, but um, just, just hearing some of your personal things. Hi. Yeah, no, I think. <laughs> okay, that's easy. I guess. Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, just, I, I, I have some more questions, but I guess I don't want to sort of roll on. I just put a. Um, there, there is something that you can see on YouTube. Uh, Elizabeth Warren, she was a oh senator. Yeah. She, she did a hearing in the Senate mm -hmm. about specifically what you wanted to do at Occupy, uh, basically bringing in some people about who, who had not properly reviewed uh, banks who were essentially money laundering for, for some of these drug cartel giants. Uh, and, you know, what, what, what's it take to bring somebody under a, an actual review? Um, so that's so that's kind of interesting. I, I'm just wondering if, if you could sort of highlight a little bit more about what what you think addictions are and, and possibly why that word is is inappropriate. I think you've, you've sort of sum, summarized that a little bit now. Um, that's a very good question. I think the thing is, um, let's say there were three main historical periods or three main explanations of that level of drug use, right? And the first response was, and is still, obviously, to punish and lock up. And then the not next one was to say, well, actually, this group of people are not well, and they can't help themselves. And then there's what you just alluded to earlier, and, you know, people want to use drugs. And if they can use them without hurting anybody else, what exactly is the big deal? Addiction, the word itself, has offended and still is offending some, you know, quite acknowledged or recognised, should I say, user activists of my ilk of users, you know, uh, because it is tied to such a huge punishing system mm -hmm. of, you know, so-called treatment, etc. You know, treatment that you go in and you can't listen to music that's got the word drug in it for six months or <laughs> I mean seriously this is still happening you know um, so it's, it's the association you know you would have thought that if you said oh this is a, is a disease then it's the doctor that needs to be called in but still and particularly in the state I mean that's, that's the conundrum that we're up against it's like the states were the ones that were like yes you know banging this is a disease but they wanted to treat the disease with a really harsh, blunt instrument. Mm. So, you know, these guys that are resistant to the wording have a right, actually, to mm. what I mean. I, I, you know, we have lots of discussions, but I've got a big, huge conversation. It never will stop, but, but that's what the core of it is, as I understand mm. it. Is that, is that no, it makes a lot of sense. Punitiveness yeah. in and of itself is being yeah. the problem. It's the, that's the tool of the ruling classes. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. yeah. And it's very interesting the solutions you provide as well, is that it's the unity of all of the class. And, and anything, you know, whether it's the gay movements or other types of movements that come before it, it's never, you know, and any of us acting just... Uh, well, yeah, yeah. Sorry, um, one question, kind of... Um, and to talk a bit about it, you keep making reference to the user community. Oh, right. Um, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, I've never been a part of that world. Yeah. Um, so I just wondered how, how interconnected is that kind of Very thing? Very good question. And how, kind of, how do people relate to each other when you're all kind of, I don't know what I mean, addictive, obviously, but you know, all using and all kind of together. Yeah, right. Very good question. Okay, so, so in the harm reduction movement, which is essentially uh, top-down intervention from professionals with money, including money from government. Let's talk about this country for now, because otherwise it gets very complicated. Um, you know, it is essentially embracing, and the, the core principle of harm reduction is, people are using drugs, how can we reduce the greatest harm? AIDS, overdoses, suicide, murders, and so on, yeah? Uh, so, Within that family, if you like, there is a huge space that includes drug users to do their organising. So, largely, that is about uh, injection drug users and their ex peers and any allies that want to be involved. More recently, in the last decade or so, there's been a uh, move towards 
you know, bringing the groups together that are not dependent necessarily on substances so that they can work together on the core issue, which is the punitive prohibitive system. Now, there was, a, there was an aborted um, attempt a decade ago in London here by a guy who's a great activist, Matt Southwell. Um, there was also, I mean, you know, there is still that connectedness, but I don't know, like, maybe I'm not part of it as much as I used to be, so I'm not really sure about the details. I did invite two people from the international movement to come. Uh, they're here in London, so, you know, they, they would have known maybe better than me. But um, there's the uh, Legalized Cannabis Alliance, and there's, again, you know, if I was going to join, you know, if I was going to sort of reform the charity that I set up, like in, in 1995, my life partner died of AIDS, uh, and in his memory, I set up an organisation that was organised drug users, and I thought to do that for a long time until I became a mother. Um, and I did do it, in fact, all over this city, and I helped around the world as well. But um, I was really eager to you know, get the other drug using part. And, and they're much bigger, in fact. You know, they're, they're millions of people. You know, how many people smoke marijuana in this country, per se? How many people take ecstasy on the weekend? How many people take cocaine? You know, let's not go to the stock market for a minute, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, there's millions of people who, who take drugs recreationally. So, so there, there, are, there are connections, but they're a little tenuous. And I think they probably are partly, you know, this is, this is really hard to say, but I think that one of our problems is, shame on me for saying this, but I think sometimes one of our problems is, is drugs themselves. Because, you know, if people are, you know, and if your priority, is what I'm trying to say, is access in a substance, then it can be, it can be problematical. On the other hand, there have been the most remarkable uh, organisations that still exist to this day and will go on existing, I think, really, until prohibition ends, because what else can they do? They, we will keep burying our dead, we'll keep burying our dead, we'll keep promoting our dead, but, you know, in the end, we cannot... And even if prohibition does fall, let's say, you know, next year, the new president of, you know, let's dream for a moment, the new president of America, who's even better than both Obama, and, you know, even if the whole thing came apart, we'd still be burying our dead. You know, from the point of view of that, you know, chemically dependent community. But, we feel deeply that that death rate would be hugely reduced. Because we would not be living in such stressful circumstances day in, day out, you know. So, from our point of view, as, you know, I say our and we, but I think, you know, it's always, I've got to put it back to Andrea here, there is always the need for that connectedness that you just, you know, asked about. And it is happening, it's just, you know, we, so far in this country, let me put it this way, we haven't maintained it. That doesn't mean it's not happening, okay? They've transformed down in Bristol, they've done a huge amount of stuff around, you know, I mean, they're not really a drug user group, but they're certainly advocating legalisation and so on and so on, although they call it legal, re legal regulation and control, rather than legalisation. So it's happening, certainly, as I say. Yeah, what is that, sorry, just yeah, yeah. saying just remind me of this. Um, is there a kind of um, professionalisation of some of this going on? I mean, I know, like, in, uh, about sex work, there's a big thing, you know, you've got the kind of rescue people and then you've got, you know, the sex workers trying to organize, you know, trying to organize against the laws. And there's quite a big split between the two. Mm -hmm. I mean, that doesn't exist in the in this in this context. Well, I think the split is less <laughs> pronounced. Okay. You know, because if you consider that um, sex workers don't have to be dependent on their professional allies. Right, for yeah. anything really. Mm -hmm. Although, of course, there are some sex workers who also, I mean, I saw sex as well. I mean, you know, sure. yeah, yeah. most of us did. Um, and not only women, either, of mm -hmm. course. Um, 
you know, so I think that is a different... Okay. I mean, it's not, it's not different in as much as, you know, there is some conflict. Mm. Because, you know, in the end, when a group of people are trying to get their power back and their confidence back and all of that, their health, whatever, it's not always a good thing if somebody dies in to rescue. Mm. You know, it's really important that people themselves feel that they can get it together in whatever way they can, whether it's on drugs or not on drugs. Yeah. But I think that, um, uh, you know, I have, you know, because a lot of those, isn't it true that a lot of, with the sex worker scene, it's about religious bodies who want to save people from the street? Well, and it's not necessarily religious, it's, you know, anyone. Anyone. Uh, that's uh, part of the problem. Uh, okay. That's and another kind of religion, got, yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got, you know, Of, 
of, you know, a lot of this stuff uh, is, is quite managed. A lot of this stuff has to be brought in. Uh, uh, I'm only saying that the, the, the management of the actual product and the management of, of how we actually approach it. Um, and, and I think that it was a little bit covered in your talk, but I just felt inspired to talk about it just simply because I think it's very close to what you were talking about, because that's also kind of an addiction, sexual addiction. Yes, I must say that one time I drank wine in Kabul, Afghanistan, about eight years ago, and it was really weird, because the guy, our host, asked me, he said, oh, I'm just going to get some wine. He, he brought us around for dinner. And I go, but it's legal, isn't it? And he goes, oh, yeah. He goes down there like that, and uh, don't worry, Andrea. And then he just came back an hour later, and and but it was like my response was so naive, you know. But I mean, I, I think that kind of my theory is actually that people who get addicted to quite a lot of drugs actually are quite young, but, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I don't mean that in a bad way. I think that you know. I think that when we write up the history books and all the rest of it, and, you know, doctors and nurses and all those people who tried to help me and others, I've seen it enormously, you know, that children they get, you know, let up the garden party and the rest of it. You know, it's not a bad thing, it's just that you have to be careful. You know, and that's why, you know, when I responded to you in there, it's like I feel that I can't walk the tightrope with, with with um, complacency. Do you understand what I mean by that? Like, I, I don't ever see myself as somebody who's completely out of the world, particularly in my case, because I have to say synthetic opiates every day for arthritis now. You know, so I'm not in a position to think, you know, I'll never smoke another cigarette, I'll never take heroin again. I have to always... And, you know, there are people that do feel proud and complacent, and God bless them if they... I'm happy, really. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had a time, but I'm sorry for asking so many questions. Um, I guess I have another question, Ted. Um, you're very open about all this, and, and, and quite willing to talk about it, but in a lot of like, kind of families and communities, it's quite taboo, it's quite a super subject, and it's quite, I guess it's quite hard, difficult to start having this dialogue about drug reform and people don't ever want to talk about it. For example, in my kind of extended family, uh, um, um, someone in my family um, died of AIDS because he was telling his body to fund the habit. Um, and this is never talked about ever at all. It is not brought up. It's like exercise from the family tree, you know, essentially. And I just wondered how, how can you break that within your own kind of small structures and things like that? Because I think that's where the real change is going to come with the public consciousness change tomorrow night. Well, what we did in the early days of uh, organising here, I mean, this is why I set up this charity in the name of John Wardle, my late husband, because, you know, it's like he said, right, we're going to go on telly, but we're not going to hide. Right? He had AIDS, and he was an addict in his case, you know? And, you know, a lot of gay men did the same, you know, talking about the HIV issue here mainly, yeah? And it's the only way. You know, we've got to stop with that. You know, that's one thing, because, of course, the media is a big way to get out there somehow. But I think in terms of local organising, you have to really, really be very, very sensitive um, about how you do that. And you need to follow, well, this is how I see it, for what it's worth. You need to follow whoever has come to you. So if a mother came to me and said, oh, you know, Andrea, in my neighbourhood we need to set up a group for this, you know, might be just the mothers or fathers or whatever, I would just follow whatever they felt they needed because that, that, you know, you can't just expect everybody to go on the television and come out the closet and, you know, it's just not reasonable, you know. So, I don't know, that's the way I view it. I mean, because when you're talking, isn't it true that when you're talking about grassroots movements, it's always like that, that you must really follow the energy. It's like, who, who is here that wants to do this? You know, and I, you know, I'm sorry for your loss, and I think that's a terrible way for things to go, but I just know so many people, it's not unusual, is it? Mm. Mm. But we're fighting back, <laughs> so don't sit there. <laughs> okay. 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 Okay.
that's it. Okay, guys, thank you so much. <laughs> I'll see you later. You I'll come back in about... <laughs> what time is the uh, basic? Oh, seven. Oh, seven. Back. Back soon.